Let's get close, but not so close. Quarantine. You can share her from a distance. Quarantine. You know we want to see each other. We'll have to stay in your quarantine space while we talk. <laughs> Welcome to episode 27 of Quarantine. Uh, I'm Peter Hirschberg, and today it is also June 19th, Juneteenth, and we're going to have a very special guest, uh, the hip-hop architect Michael Ford, who's going to talk to us about how that form of music helps decode our cities and also prepare us. So this is going to be a very interesting show uh, with kind of a, a deep dive on kind of what's happened in urban development, uh, how displacement has happened. We'll look at some historical documents. We'll talk about how this conference that Mickey and Nicole and I have been running for the last week fits into this. I think it's a wonderful show to help uh, this whole conversation about how we're doing planning coming out of COVID. How do we plan for flourishing cities? And boy, what can we learn from the past? So this will be interesting because there's such amazing historical stuff and insight today. So let's welcome Mickey. Hi, Mickey. Hey Peter, how you doing? I'm, you I'm, I'm uh, very have had a very uh, busy week, yeah. But, it, but it's exciting, and I'm really uh, looking forward to sharing uh, what Michael Ford is doing because I've been blown away uh, with with his perspective. And uh, it was wonderful to see his focus on just cities be shared globally with uh, with what Nicole has been up to. And uh, can we get Nicole in here as well? It'd be nice to say hi. Hi guys. Hi. Hi. Hey Nicole. Um, so Nicole, you just finished this crazy global multi-city. How many cities was it happening in at once? It was like, like well, we uh, anchored on three time zones, uh, but we had yeah. people from all over the world, and it was a combination uh -huh. of scientists, researchers, architects, designers, technologists, engineers from all over the world looking at flourishing cities and technology and finding, finding ways to reimagine uh, the city to be a platform of transformation. So and Nicole, before we go too far, it might be good uh, just because many viewers might have not ever met you or heard you or seen you in past episodes. You've, you've joined us a few times and it's been wonderful. What's your what's your thing? Like, what is this transformational tech thing? What is that? <laughs> yeah. So, um, so what it is? It's the trans. I'm the executive director, everybody, of the Transformative Technology Lab, and we focus on well-being tech and transformative tech. And what our thesis is is that well-being is the essential key for work, health, and human excellence, and that exponential technologies apply to human psychology is actually the right tool to, to bend the arc of human history towards abundance. And so we look at technology for mental and emotional well-being. So we're looking at stress, anxiety, depression, happiness, and sleep. Um, we're looking at technology for social and emotional wellness. So that's um, self-awareness, emo self emotional self-regulation, all of the human interaction skills that allow you to team well, whether that's in a family or a community or a company. And uh, we're looking at human potential and performance. So that's enhancing and expanding cognition, emotional capacity, purpose, meaning. And it's all about applying technology to that. So the goal is, it's like right now we're in a world that's filled with stress, anxiety, um, toxic relationships, toxic companies. And we want to get to a world where people have the mental and emotional well-being that they need for health. They have the social and emotional wellness that they need to team successfully, and they have the human potential and performance that they need to become the self that they would like to be. Um, and so we run a big conference. We have a global community. We have people in 72 countries and 450 cities. And our mission is to help founders find feedback, funding, and friends, and investors to find great companies to invest in. Oh, and it's perfect. interesting to point out how all this relates to cities. And here's the interesting thing. Um, uh, when you think of these forms of mindfulness tech, you easily see how they apply to the individual, right? You can think about how an in individual does meditation or yoga or how an individual mm. might use a piece of quantified self-technology uh, to, to regulate these things. 
But what does it mean to apply it to a population or to a city? Well, the origin of this is, is kind of a whole new field got built here, flourishing cities, when Nicole, who came from kind of mindfulness and psychology and wellness and her whole community. Um, technology. And technology. So that whole community starts meeting up with the behavioral economics community, the, the community that says well, there are all of these incentives we could do to get people to behave differently, even if they didn't know it was in their interest. But if we can use technology to monitor things and get people to behave differently, we can then use this discipline to actually do it and do it for populations. Then we added in cities. So cities increasingly are being instrumented and they're sensing and is well, making- and I think it, I think it's important to note that the, that Nicole has actually had a, a focus for quite a long time on the behavioral tech, social tech uh, uh, area. But one of the interesting things that I think like Ting Jiang and others have brought to this yeah. idea is that sometimes up to 70% of our cognition is shaped by the physical environment or by the external context. It's not inside of our inner landscape. It's it's the world, whether it's a checkbox that says you should be an organ donor or not. It's not you that makes those decisions. We're an autopilot. So when we really start saying, whoa, actually the city is shaping behavior, whether we like it or not. So how do we actually build a city that helps us with mind and meaning, that helps us create a safe psychological place and hmm. build potential and that really weaves together both the people on the very edges pushing the arts as well as really starts to bring in some of these new sciences some of the hardest sciences of all the soft sciences you know that, that really is about us and social emotional learning but also not just me but us and we and 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 i think that's where uh, i think all of us have gotten very excited about this and that's that's a little bit about what this big with this big flourishing uh, summit, the first in I think a series of of get-togethers was all about. Nicole, what do you what do you leave just uh, just from your standpoint, Nicole? What do you see as something? Um, you just finished it. You're like burned out. You've like been probably awake for <laughs> the last few few days. What? How are you feeling? How how like what are some what are some emotions you have? What are some ways you're you're feeling after after the end of this first? Kind of get together around around flourishing cities for humanity well you know whenever you curate something as you know it's like you have an idea as to what it might be but then when it actually comes together and you see the people you imagined having conversations having conversations and mm -hmm. um and 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 saying things like wow that like that just blew my mind because they're on a overlapping but not the same disciplines and having mm. sort of, I think Peter calls it jazz. So seeing the jazz you, that you knew was probably going to happen, but seeing the jazz is incredibly rewarding. And, and for myself, even though I knew everyone um, who was going to be there and why they were selected to be there, um, still it's like having it all come together was really mind blowing for me and, um, and greatly rewarding. We, uh, this, 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 when, when different in a, different communities or, or disciplines rub up against each other, that's when you get something new. And, uh, Omid, we should put this diagram up. Uh, this conference really, and this thinking, this framework came up from, uh, you know, several disciplines rubbing against each other, right? We had, we had the sensing and hard sciences of city science. We had the flourishing technology world. Uh, we had, uh, some of the predictive analytics world. So we came up with this uh, framework that said that uh, there's this whole bit about uh, minds and meaning, which is which is really that there's an evolving science. And we talked about this in the last show with Ting. There's an evolving science uh, that can actually understand uh, how we are in better places of being and how we code for that. And we've been good at the hard sciences for a few hundred years, but we're just getting good at that. And when you then connect that stuff up with the tools and the techniques that we had, and our second day was called Arts and Sciences, and we heard from people like Poppy Crumb, who's the chief scientist at Dolby, about all the ways we can instrument our world. And then the third day, Places and Potential, we focused on kind of how this might be instantiated in the world. And we heard from, uh, uh, I think it's Jeff Ehrlich, who has uh, the, the Regen Villages. So we talked about how this highly distributed technology of... Uh, local food and local uh, energy and circular economies could fit in. We heard from the head of planning from Singapore who looks at it on a very large scale. Uh, and then uh, we also spoke, spoke with uh, a woman from uh, 
Rockefeller resilient cities? How is it that networks of cities can help each other? These are all examples of how these distributed functions can work together. And the other really interesting person we had yesterday was this guy, Michael Ford, the hip hop architect. And I knew of Michael's work and he spoke Mickey over at Autodesk because he was teaching young people who grew up in the language of hip hop to use that to understand architecture. But then he made another really cool point here, which is hip hop is the post occupancy report of our city. So it turns out if an architect builds a building, he does a post occupancy report that says, did it perform? Did the people like it? Were they using it the way they're supposed to? Did we get it right? What's going on here? And okay, so if you think of urban renewal or you think of the, the kinds of things that were done in the 50s and the 60s uh, in clearing ghettos and trying to make things better, if you were to write a post-occupancy report, the answer would be it didn't go so well because actually crime went up and, and family life and things got worse. And hip hop is the language of that post-occupancy report because what goes on is people who are talking about their being, their aspirations and what's going on there. I'd never thought of it that way. And, uh, and, and it was a fascinating point of view, not only because it's a, a way of looking and seeing the condition, but then because so many kids grow up with the language of hip hop, if you can then teach them how to think about architecture and city planning and the role they can have, uh, that's incredible sense of agency, especially since some very few percent of people of color become architects. He's gonna be with us in a moment. So Mick, you want, may wanna talk about lack collaboration. And before that, we're gonna show a really interesting clip of how we got to that circumstance. It's a film about San Francisco planning all the good intentions. It's the setup for what then hip hop helps us deconstruct. Yeah, well, I, I'll hold off. Why don't you show the show this first clip to set things up? Okay. Um, uh, Michael uh, has a lot to say, and I think there's some wonderful, yeah. wonderful so, stuff. I'd rather his voice say Let's it. set it up this way. Now, and one of the reasons we're doing this, well, we're doing this because this is a very interesting lens on cities and African-Americans, and this is Juneteenth. But also, here's here's the show Quarantine, and, our, and the, the, what are we talking about? We're talking about how do we plan better for the future at a time of consequential change? One of the great things to look at is, well, how do we go about planning when we saw problems before? So if we go back to the beginning of the 20th century, people are streaming into cities. And cities weren't known as fun places where you hung out and had a, a latte. Cities were actually where industry was, where disease was. People would just some get, get out. I mean, Dickens kind of nailed this in the Industrial Revolution. Then the uh, progressive era comes along. We have the the child labor laws, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory that that you know, building codes come in, things get things get a bit better. But as we head into the 1930s, there's a general sense that there's a lot of squalor in cities and that it would be healthier if people went to the suburbs. So so we went in with this with this mentality that it would be great to build the suburbs. And of course, what that does is it leads to a dynamic of white flight. So you end up with more concentrated, less wealth in the cities, people are leaving. And then there's desire to go fix the cities. And um, as, as uh, William w White famously wrote about cities in the 1950s, a lot of people like to fix cities, not that many people love them, which is an odd thing because today, mostly people love cities. And maybe after COVID, they like to take a break, but we've been in that era. And the solution to this was urban renewal and super blocks in this sense that we're gonna get rid of the slums because the problem is the sum, slums. So we're gonna knock them down, build these new housing developments, and it will be better for people. And this was probably well-intentioned, though it didn't work out well. It was somewhat racist because there was redlining. So there was a lot that was going on there. Um, and so that's the setup. That's kind of like the form of planning. As this was going on, a number of people thought it's not going to work out well. And by the 1970s, we were kind of full on in the middle of it. And this is a film on redevelopment made in San Francisco in 1974. It's called Redevelopment, a Marxist take on urban renewal. And what's interesting is one, it, it shows people saying this is about to happen and may not be good. And of course, you know, 40 years later, we can see what happened. But secondly, I think as I look at this, what was Marxist then appears to be just kind of, you know, common knowledge now about how cities work. So before we look at the hip hop era, a reaction to what we're about to see, it's 1974. And here is a Marxist take on what San Francisco is doing in its urban development uh, plans. A 
run up one step further. We don't want what you have to offer. Wait, you can't destroy the whole world. People will fight when the time is right. Wait. successful in revitalizing the city, giving it new impetus, Diamond Heights, which was bare land and is now a nice home community, heart of Twin Peaks where you get views, the Golden Gateway, which was an old run-down produce district, of course we built the Rockefeller Security Pacific Bank building, hotel going up at the lower end of Market Street and another Rockefeller building starting within the next month. The third one is the Western Edition A1 where you have St. Mary's Cathedral and all that area around there, the sequoias and, and low-cost housing and uh, high-cost housing, high-priced apartments. That was all slum area. Uh, we were uprooted about five times in less time than two months, uh, being moved by redevelopment agency. Um, my children, it affected them in their schooling, and their school records will show that, that they uh, suffered setbacks because they had to change from one school to another, and it was really rough. It was just bad. And the children were frustrated because they weren't able to get themselves situated. You know, they just didn't, uh, they did, just didn't adjust. They didn't have time because of the way that we were being moved around. The redevelopment agency just told us we had to move and they said that the house had been purchased. And when now, uh, they get, they, uh, more or less on site that means that you're just still moving from one redevelopment structure into another one. In the late 1950s, the redevelopment agency demolished 44 blocks, throwing 6,000 black, Japanese, and white families out into the street. With rent for $235 a month for studios in Cathedral Hill apartments, the church built the Sequoia, housing for old folks. It took you a $10,000 down payment to move in. A million-dollar cathedral was built by the Catholic Church. The core of the whole project is the Japanese Trade Center, designed to lure Japanese firms to invest in San Francisco. The center was built by Kentetsu Enterprises, a subsidiary of one of Japan's largest multinational corporations. One of the lowest rent areas there ever was for, for what you get was the Western Edition. And contrary to what a lot of people think, is when people were living in the Fillmore, uh, at the time redevelopment really started getting underway, you could get good houses, good flats, for $100 a month, six or seven room flats for your family. Let me say that the problems of urban decay that face the Fillmore now and face the Fillmore in 1948 when the redevelopment agency was created were problems of urban decay that were created, that were manipulated, they were manufactured is what I'm saying. The first step was a newspaper campaign that discredited Fillmore and its residents. Photographers carried along after city inspectors on lightning raids into the worst buildings. Using these isolated examples, front page pictures and articles characterized the entire neighborhood as blighted. And the newspapers were rewarded. The Chronicle got redevelopment land in the Western Edition to build a new TV studio. They spread the idea that the Fillmore was a dangerous slum, dope prostitution, senseless murders, a threat to public health and safety that had to be eradicated. Of course, this was news to us that lived here. We saw it as just a neighborhood where people survived as best they knew how, and that usually meant working. People did. It was more of them on Fillmore Street. And so, like in the afternoon, like this time of day, like you and I are talking, it was a, a total stream of Hello, how are you, and what you doing, and where you going, and how are the kids, and how, how's your mother, and, and did you go here or there? And you just uh, never was on Fillmore Street uh, 
for a hot minute unless you met someone you knew to hang out with minutes, even if it's from ice cream con to go out with beer, talk about what you did last night, or where you were going, and whose birthday was where, you know, it was really a, a, a total neighborhood. White people lived and came here all the time. After downtown, the Fillmore was the main shopping district. Actually, up until 1955, Fillmore Street was the cultural center of all San Francisco. People came from all over to see the great stars like Billie Holiday, Miles Davis, and Duke Ellington perform. San Francisco is designed to be the financial and uh, uh, administrative center of the hemisphere. And that means that San Francisco does not have room for working class people. Just, just run out of room. They have room for administrators, they have room for junior executives, and that's it. And so, uh, to try to deal with just one small issue, such as housing, without going into the larger things surrounding it, would be foolish. And, I, and, 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 and our job, I think, is to, like, explain that. Because with the machinery being what it is, and with our powers being what they are in the community, you can't always stop it but you can always explain why it's happening. And then the people themselves, once they begin to develop a political understanding of what's happening, they happen, ultimately. Okay, so much for muted mics. Boy, that could have been as current as tomorrow. Yeah. Um, and uh, first of all, it's really interesting. I live in that neighborhood, right? And and I, I look out my window and I see that Japantown structure, uh, and the and it's it's right. Th th this is the very same conversation that's going on now in terms of displacement and who does San Francisco want to have around. And the portion of the film that that it didn't really that get into is what it was replaced with, right? They showed some of the brutal structures, but but then kind of what's the legacy of the form of urban redevelopment that came in next. Um, hmm. That's an interesting setup, I think, for Michael Ford. So maybe, Mick, you want to set up how you first got to know Michael, and then we can go into the segment with Michael. You bet. Um, so a few years ago, um, I was, um, well, up until January, I was a fellow in the office of the CTO at Autodesk. I'm, I'm now, I shifted over to emeritus status. But um, one of my focus areas a few years ago was working with the education team. So I was helping out the vice president of Learning Futures, Randy Swearer. And so I joined the education team as a fellow to just sort of explore what, what learning might look like in the future and how we might use machine learners to accelerate human learning, something we call generative learning where we apply generative design and goal-directed design to learning itself using um, the emerging field of what's called dynamic formative assessments, where you could kind of, you could see what people really do, like when they use the shop, when they use the maker place, instead of trying to guess or instead of having classic summative assessments like teach to the test and multi-choice tests. So, so something much more natural, it's actually been proven to show a ton of growth for people's brains and how we might accelerate human learning and growth with machine learners as jazz partners. And um, while we were doing that, um, one of the big programs that we have for youth is called Tinkercad. And there are probably 10 million kids from eight years old to 80 years old a, a month using Tinkercad. It's probably a better design tool in many ways than any CAD tool or computer aided design tool I ever used um, when I was a product designer. It's kind of brilliant and it's free for everybody in the world. Just it, all you need is a Chrome browser. And they were using Tinkercad to kind of help help kids build this bridge from making something fun to actually learning how to make something that could be actually manufactured to learning how to actually write code and build programmable structures like spiral staircases that are made from you know two pieces of code and what they call code blocks or or manufacture something cool in virtual world and then make it into a pile of Legos. And um, and Sarah, who leads the Tinkercad initiative there. Um, basically said, hey, we're doing this crazy thing where we, Autodesk sponsors this hip hop architect. And I was like, what's a hip hop architect? I don't even know what that is. And she said, well, we're gonna be running uh, a two day workshop. We're bringing in, he's bringing in a bunch of his um, friends who are amazing hip hop artists. And he's bringing in 
urban planners and architects and and young kids and over the course of two days they're going to deconstruct the post occupancy surveys uh, of America from the eyes of the hip hop artists who have really told us a lot about their cities if we only listened and we're going to teach the kids to learn about this and we're going to help the kids and the artists work together to understand how space shapes our perception and whether it becomes a backdrop for oppression or whether it becomes a backdrop for expression. And um, and I was a small part of it and just got a chance to 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 really observe and and jump in once or twice and just be a maker, which was great. Just draw pictures and make things. Um, but I was blown away by what's going on. And Michael has run these workshops with high school kids around the country and in fact globally as well. And so um, when we started talking with Nicole about just cities and flourishing cities and how do we actually bring in much more of the citizenry and then we also have what's happening right now in America with this experiment called America. Um, it, it just felt very timely and so I'm super excited and uh, I'd love to just have Michael share. We did a, a wonderful interview and if we can just uh, jump into the interview and we'll talk a little bit about it more after that and we'll also be including links to uh, an extended version of the interview um, on the quarantine site if you'd like to hear a little bit more and of course our site has a bunch of the other information as well including some of the some of the uh, documentaries we're gonna we're gonna share later uh, during this episode so you can always find resources there um, Omid let's go ahead and bring in Michael thanks for joining us um, I appreciate you taking a little bit of time. I mean, you're you're up to amazing things. Could you tell us a little bit of your background and about the movement you're building, the the this this idea about just architecture? Yeah. So thanks for taking a minute to talk. But I am originally from Detroit, Michigan. I'm now based in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, and I received my master's degree in architecture. Uh, from the University of Detroit, and I've been working as a as a designer uh, since then, so uh, 2006. So I've been in the profession about 14 years, and uh, what I have a deep interest in is uh, the impacts of architecture and urban planning on on end users, and um, looking at that impact um, in some unique ways. So uh, this idea of just architecture or the just city um, is it, a conversation that's been a while, been around for a few decades, but um, adding a new voice to it, and that's the voice of the community members themselves. Um, and what I've done is I've created this um, way of using hip hop to talk about architecture. Yeah, say more about that. I'm not sure. I'm not sure everybody would understand how hip hop intersects with architecture. Yeah, so I call hip hop uh, modernism's post occupancy evaluation. Right, hip -hop What's a post occupancy hip -hop? evaluation? Real quick. What's it's for yeah. non architects? So as as a designer or an architect, if you design a hospital, after you finish that hospital, you're going to talk with the doctors, the nurses, the building engineers. So the people um, who are going to occupy it, uh, right? Did it work? <laughs> exactly. You want to see how successful uh, okay. it is. You may even talk to yeah. some of the patients about their experience. And the goal is the next time you build a hospital, it's even better than that one. Um, mm. And what I say about hip hop, um, hip hop was born in these uh, modern uh, ideas, these modern utopias for um, <laughs> for inner cities, right? Mm. Um, so the work of Le Corbusier and some of these uh, modernists that are celebrated unintentionally laid the groundwork that would birth hip hop in the Bronx. Mm. And what hip hop music is, if you listen to it, it is a unsolicited, unfiltered <laughs> critique mm. of the environments from which the culture was born. Um, yeah, these so are artists about, who are reacting to what what they're feeling in these concrete jungles, right? In these places that maybe weren't designed for them or weren't designed for, for really the people who have to live there. <laughs> yeah, it, it was this idea that not only, um, you know, you think about the architecture uh, for most public housing projects, uh, what's interesting, the architecture was designed like a crucifix, if you look at the form mm -hmm. from an aerial mm -hmm. view. 
and this is uh, Le Corbusier's idea of architecture as a machine. He believed that people, once they inhabited the space, you can create a better person if the architecture is a machine. Um, and he believed mm. that this crucifix form, along with all the programmatic elements, would create a better working class citizen. Um, mm. Very interesting way to modernist thought, but hip hop tears all that shit up and just says, this was your idea of urban renewal, but here's the reality of mm. urban renewal. So I uh, juxtapose lyrics with statements from what architects and urban planners thought they were going to achieve. And again, show the, what they actually mm. did uh, through hip hop. You know, right now in the United States, um, less than 3% of uh, licensed architects are African-American. Less than 0.2% are African-American uh, women. So uh, very few of us are responsible for um, designing and building our communities, which we all know has a profound impact on whether you are uh, successful or not <laughs> in the long run, right? There's our buildings, our spaces either deny or perpetuate injustices. And um, unfortunately, it's not a lot of us who are um, part of those uh, design efforts. So my goal by using is to make architecture relevant. And it's not a gimmick. Um, you know, some people think you will just assign a song and dance to architecture. Now people will flood. No, we're giving people a real challenge to solve some of the systemic issues that are perpetuated by built spaces. And we're allowing them to explore the, the lyrics of their favorite MCs um, who have given or provided some provocative solutions to some of the problems. So not only does our music critique, but it also provides uh, a glimpse of um, solutions. So with that 3%, I'm looking to raise that number by making the profession relevant and giving a direct charge and ultimately a new vernacular for young people uh, coming into the profession. A vernacular well, do you think, them. yeah, I mean, I suspect that maybe, maybe it's not a, a cultural thing, like I'm gonna be an architect when I grow up, or maybe it's not um, anything they even think, they don't see anybody that looks like them. If it's only 3% or 0.2% women, you know, it, it helps to have, to have somebody you can aspire to be. You know, where's the hero? Where's the thing? And, and how do we get a whole generation, really? And it seems like that's your movement. You know, you've we've yeah. quit your day job. You're like taking a serious <laughs> stand and, and you're, yeah. you're, you're saying, look, these shouldn't be backdrops or sets for injustice which frankly like every of the right feel they are. you know i looked at, at the stadiums and the other things being used for bad things <laughs> totally agree yeah, we, as a profession you know we can't be complacent with you know designing those backdrops of injustice and we have to think of architecture as something beyond bricks and mortar and, and that's what the just city is it's looking at design um, beyond bricks and mortar, but what are the policies, uh, laws that are um, housed within our spaces? You know, what's happening in August? What's, what's going on with uh, your next step in terms of building a movement, a hip hop architecture? Yeah, so we uh, conduct hip hop architecture camps around the country. We're actually done a, a, a few internationally as well, which is usually a face-to-face program but with um you know the challenges we're facing right now with covid uh, we switched to a digital platform uh so in august 1st we're conducting a hip-hop architecture camp for 1500 uh young people uh mm. across uh the united states where we're going to tackle you know some of the very issues that we've been discussing um mm. you know how does they how does their community look now? Why does it look that way? What has their music said about the neighborhood? And then now let's solve it. Let's solve any issues that have been rapped about or that you have observed. And then let's make a new song. Now that mm. the uh, solution is there, our young people make their own music, which looks towards the future, which is another amazing thing about architectural mm. education. You are convinced that you can see something <laughs> that no one else can see. You <laughs> are right. imagining the future, space and mm. place. You are imagining and getting people to buy into your 
imagination of the future. You're getting people to understand scale, um, material. You got to kind of you've got to communicate that vision through story, which which also feels like very relevant to artists and rappers and and hip hop artists and others that they're right. telling stories. Like we remember stories, we don't remember facts. At every single program, no matter what city we're in, there's mm. new conversations that are being uh, discussed as you know, each region in the United States has a different style of, of hip hop, if you mm. will. And they have different artists that young know, people are associated and they have unique stories and problems that they are responding to in their music. Uh, with Lupe, I mean, he started to describe project buildings and he has a song called Daydreaming. And he gave the backstory about um, daydreaming um, about buildings in, in the city of Chicago. He told some stories about his dad telling him that if you put all the buildings together in downtown Chicago, they'll become a robot. He said he never forgot this. And he wow. has a song called Daydreaming where he reimagines a housing project building as a robot. And he describes each one of the joints of this mm. walking robot with all of the injustices that people face in housing projects. So mm. um, it, it's very poetic. And um, again, he's providing these foundational pieces for people that are architects, engineers, urban planners to pick up mm. and um, you know use as information for designing a just city. Um, if you had a provocation, you know, uh Clearly your focus, and I think rightly so, is, is in your location and your place and your culture, you know, the African-American community and, and the needs that we have right now are just significant if we're gonna make this experiment called America work. Um, and it's being, it's being challenged for good reasons, just structural violence and, and, and structural racism. What would you say to the global audience who it may not be the same marginalization or oppression or, in just spaces, but I suspect I suspect people are grappling with this all over the world. What would you say to them? How how might they think differently about their own communities that they're building, their own cities that they're building, um, in other parts of the world? Yeah, I I would say that um, again, hip hop has been defined as a voice of the voiceless, and no matter where uh, hip hop is, it always represents. Um, that community and the voices within those communities. So similar to, you know, our music here in the U.S., um, you know, I challenge people all across the globe to listen to the music. Um, don't don't just listen to what's happening here in the U.S. Yes, we have, you know, some international superstars. <laughs> well, listen to what the people in your communities uh, are talking about, because, again, they're um, critiquing. They're expressing it. Yeah. So. Um, I know that may not have been the most earth shattering challenge, but um, again, it's something that I don't think we've done as um, as architects, planners, builders, um, really listening to what our young people are. We, we create um, places for them to share information. So we have these town halls and these formal meeting spaces where we want them to articulate themselves in certain manners. Um, I'd say hip hop will give you probably every answer that you want and you don't have to worry about somebody being politically correct um, with you know other folks sitting around them critiquing what they say mm -hmm. or how they say it. Mm -hmm. Michael, thank you so much. This has been, yeah, just a lot of things to take in and, and really exciting just to see what you're doing and the fact that you're kind of redirecting yourself to focus on this full time. Um, and I'd love to see cities around the world figure this out, but also how can we learn from other places that have actually tried to listen to their culture, to their art, to, to, to the people that are in the communities? And how can we, how can we build something better and get, a, get an army of hip hop architects going, like get, a, get a movement going? That's, that's the answer. Get an army of hip hop architects. <laughs> the time and, um, yeah, in, in the Thank very you, Michael. A great question. So talk to you soon. Uh, let's see. Is Mickey's mic on? No. Nope. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, can you guys hear me?
Yeah, lots to do. And um, and if you are interested, you know, um, you can look up Hip Hop Architects uh, and Architecture. Um, he's actually recruiting people, so students, um, for this uh, for this big event in August. So if you want to learn more, uh, we've just pulled up the uh, the link. Um, if you know young African American kids who you'd love to have join a camp every day of the week, they're going to be doing something different. Um, and I think there's a huge potential here. Uh, they're not going to start by building cities. They're going to start by thinking about, about how to decode lyrics and how to do this. Um, one of the groups that, um, that Michael has teamed with um, over the last few years uh, is a group called Sosa, which, um, which, uh, um, Lupe Fiasco and a group of other hip hop artists put together where they, they are, there's sort of society of spoken arts and they, they really decode over hundreds of years all the ways people have, have written sort of from poetry to, to song to, to lyrics and things like that. And, and they bring in uh, people from Sosa, people from other parts of, of the sort of music landscape and they work with the kids. And what's really fascinating is the kids post, you can even look on YouTube, the kids post um, sort of their own hip hop songs about the things that they've learned over the few days. And then they, they, they ever do everything from thinking about what does it mean to design a thing? What does it mean to design a place? What does it mean to design a space? And they kind of build on that. So, um, and, uh, and you can learn more at societyofspokenart.org. We just pulled that one up. Uh, so, so, and, and it's kind of uh, amazing. And, and, it's about this idea that artists often push the very edges of of society, right? They're they're on the they walk to the edge and they keep going, and they are reflecting immediately what is happening in the moment. You know, they are pursuing their own understanding of the world, but they're also trying to share that and and come to some grapple with some meaning there. So it's very exciting times. Um, and if you have a if you can get involved, get involved. Um, we now are coming up on the first ever Quarantine Juneteenth Trailer Film Festival. Because That's right. Some we of our just invented it a few minutes in the ago. Yeah. Topic arena are are going on, and so um, we're actually going to take a look at three. The first film we want to talk about is Coded Bias. So if you've been watching, uh, you remember when we had uh, Safia Noble and Kathy O'Neill on, uh, mm -hmm. authors of. Um, of uh, weapons of math disruption and uh, algorithms of oppression. And so this is a film exactly about that. This is a film about uh, how uh, facial recognition doesn't recognize uh, black and brown people or how the bias in hiring algorithms doesn't even know what it's doing. It just follows existing bias and gets coded. And there you go. Uh, the film. Yeah. And this is a film by Shalini Kantaya. And it ties in with what Joy Bolamwini has been doing, uh, who has been doing amazing work around um, how algorithms and training data um, ignores and or exposes discrimination in race and gender. Um, and uh, so Sophia, um, Kathy, Joy, and a number of other people who have really been exploring how we code bias right into our systems and actually help unlucky people be unluckier um, and, and unlevel the field even more so that people don't really have a fair chance. And it's uh, very powerful. Let's show the trailer for Coded Bias. Uh, can we bring that up? This young black kid in school uniform got stopped as a result of a match. Took him down that street just to one side, um, like very thoroughly searched him. It was all plainclothes officers as well. It was four plainclothes officers who stopped him. I think him after about like maybe 10, 15 minutes of um, searching and checking his details and fingerprinting him, um, they came back and said, it's not him. 
I work for a human rights campaign organization. We're campaigning against facial recognition technology. We're campaigning against facial we're called Big Brother Watch. We're a human rights campaigning organization. We're campaigning against this technology here today. Um, and then you've just been stopped because of that, but they misidentified you. Um, these are the uh, details here. He was a bit shaken, his friends were there, they couldn't believe what had happened to them. Yeah. 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 So so You've been, mis be misidentified by their systems and they've stopped you and used that as justification to stop and search you. But this is an, an innocent young 14 year old child who's been stopped by the police as a result of a uh, facial recognition misidentification. Boy, that's frightening. Uh, that renders yeah. it well. Sweet. It does. And uh, Joy, um, when she was an undergrad at Georgia Tech, Joy Bolamwini, uh, in computer science, was trying to make an art project. So she downloaded the most popular um, facial recognition software and training data from GitHub. She started building this tool that would this fun app that would actually glue um, glue like uh, I don't know forests or different kinds of geometric objects onto her face. And when she tried to build it as this magic mirror. It wouldn't see her face, and and so the algorithm literally didn't see her, and she ended up having she felt really really almost embarrassed. She had to go grab her white roommate, and drag her roommate in to actually test her software, because her software would be recognized, and then she'd get in and she'd be unrecognized by the software. And she realized that she needed to build an algorithmic justice league and actually start thinking about this. And so when she went off to MIT to get her PhD in computer science, she started building this league of algorithmic justice fighters to say uh, the people who write the code probably have biases that are building into the software and the data itself has biases. And often black women, Asian women, other, other uh, people that uh, just aren't convenient uh, to use as training data um, either get ignored or they get over-targeted. And so this, uh, this documentary is chilling, but it's actually hopeful because I think a part of this is get the word out. Get, you know, beware. Algorithms, just because they're called algorithms and sound mathy, it doesn't mean that they can't have encoded bias. And here's something uh, cool. Uh, where While this film has been on the festival circuit and is not in theaters, you can, in fact, see it tonight because this weekend is the American Film Institute's Documentary Film Festival, and it's virtual. And so you can go on and pay to go see films. There's a limited number of tickets. You get to see them once in a DRM setting, but you can see them anywhere. And there are about 100 tickets left to uh, Coded Bias. You're These welcome now. Days, go sign up on AFI right after this show. Yeah. <laughs> and watch it. We've got tickets for tomorrow night to watch it through the Human Rights Film Festival. Uh, which also has tickets uh, through the weekend. Um, and by the way, okay, these what's are the, another? Okay. I just want to point out these are the films. I'm just going to give a plug for the AFI documentary uh, hmm. festival because normally to go to a festival, you can get an airplane, go to Utah or Sun Valley or something, and you know, slip around to see ten films. And and they're coming to us in this really cool DRM system. So like some of them are sold out and you can't go see the panel, but these are the ones that I'm looking at this weekend, just to plug them, Rebuilding a Paradise, which is about the Paradise fires, uh, White Noise, which is sold out. Uh, the Atlantic is a co-sponsor of this, is a film on uh, essentially uh, uh, extreme right-wing terrorism uh, in, in America. Uh, Down and Out in America is an oldie uh, about the impact of the Reagan era uh, and it's it's cuts unladylike, uh, which actually is a compendium of things that will be on PBS about extraordinary women, dilemmas of desire, women who are marginalized because of their sexual desire, uh, coded bias that we talked about, a film about Mayor Tubbs in uh, Stockton, and there's also one about Roy Cohn. So that's my weekend. Now let's move on mm -hmm. to the second film in our. Uh, well, let's welcome mm -hmm. Nicole Bradford back. Hello, Nicole. Nicole's back. Yeah. Hi. Oh, uh, we've been having a great time with uh, with Michael Ford, and then we also looked at some of the stuff that went on in San Francisco planning where they thought they were doing good, and the community realized that this was not going to be good. Just a great interest to go back and look at history. And now we are talking about our, our weekend film festival, uh, and we, we talked about uh, Coded Bias. And what's up next, Mickey? 
I'd love to talk about Sing Your Song. Uh, so uh, the next film is actually put together. It was produced by the daughter of Harry Belafonte. And um, I had the pleasure of meeting her at Aspen Ideas. And I said, hi, how are you doing? Why are you here? Why am I here? I, was, I had a book that I wanted to share. And she said, oh, you should come. I'm going to have a screening of my documentary tomorrow night. And it's about my dad. And I said, oh, who's your dad? And she said, it's Harry Belafonte. And I was like, what? OK, what? is this going to be a documentary about music? Uh, because Harry Belafonte is very well known um, from when I was growing up as just an amazing, both gorgeous and amazing singer uh, uh, from the Caribbean. And um, it turns out, no, she said, she wanted to make a documentary about her dad because her own children wouldn't know about him. If he, if he, if he passed away, mm -hmm. they wouldn't know all the things he did quietly and secretly for the civil rights movement. And, and just to give you a little taste, he hosted The Tonight Show in 1960 and brought on this guy, Malcolm X, and this other guy, Bobby Kennedy, who did not know each other, so that the Kennedys could actually learn about what was happening in America where they didn't believe that poverty was so, so severe for black people. Harry um, Belafonte uh, guest hosted the Harry tonight. Harry Belafonte hosted the tonight show for a week. Television. Yes. And uh, he also set up basically Kickstarter campaigns so that while the freedom fighters were marching uh, on Selma and marching there, they were getting beaten down a lot. And in Kenya, there had been an amazing revolution where people had sort of uh, taken over and had their own sort of democratically elected officials for the first time. So we actually set up a Kickstarter campaign of Pullman coach operators and had them actually fund a plane to fly the freedom fighters from Alabama to uh, Kenya to see what an entire country looks like that is run by people that look maybe more like them. And later did another Kickstarter campaign to get a 747 to fly them to America to see what democracy looks like in America. Um, and there are some Easter eggs in that, in that that you are going to be blown away with. Um, but he talks about, even to this day, uh, fighting for justice in our prison systems. And he does not go down fighting. He has refused to even go to the White House under certain administrations because of what's going on. Um, so he's a hero, but I think every citizen in the world needs to see this documentary, Sing Your Song. Uh, it is, we're going to have a link. It is available on iTunes. Uh, I don't know where else, else it's available, but but if you can find it, watch it with the whole family. I think cool. you'll be surprised. Um, all right. Show the can we show the trailer for that? Here is one of the greatest artists of the world, Harry Belafonte. Deo, Deo, he like come and he want to move. One day, Paul Robeson came to see me and simply said, get them to sing your song and they'll want to know who you are. Even in that grainy black and white early TV, his personality came out. When Harry Belafonte went on the show with Petula Clark, they touched. People were like, oh my God. Whatever you're capable of doing as artists to help propagandize the civil rights revolution. Out of that came the true artistry of Harry Belafonte. There's a lot of people out here who are really pissed off. Harry gave us a piece of his fire. It gave us all strength. We are angry. We're upset. Harry motivated Martin because he is a man who didn't have to get involved and who did. We look around for some comfort and we don't find any. I remember once when you said, from the time I get up, the time I go to sleep, I seek out the injustice that's done to humankind. What do we want? Me! What do we want? Yeah! He was always like that. He was always, let's do something. Harry did this over and over and over and over again. He took all our struggles and made them his own. We 
We can't be shut up no more. Yeah. Talk about movement building. We got to stand up. Right. We're going to organize even harder. We're going to knock on some more doors, talk to some more policy makers. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give in. Don't give in. I try to envision playing out the rest of my life almost exclusively devoted to reflection. But uh, this is too much of the world to be done. So by the way, he's 93 years old today. I mean, this year, and he is not stopping. And when you think about what one person can do in the world, I think you're gonna be surprised. Nicole, you had a comment about, about Harry. Well, there was, um, I mean, he was definitely extraordinary. One of the things that I um, put to you guys in the chat is a, another person called the, uh, who was also known as the Black Godfather, or they did a they did a video on him. It was on Clarence Avant, which most people mm. don't know about him, but he's sort of the godfather of black music. And he's not really well mm. known, but he's famous in the music industry. And he started oh, as a manager to Lalo Schifrin. Uh, and then after that, he founded record labels. Like he, you know, he worked on the Michael Jackson Coke deal. Um, he was just like, and he was known for every um every artist he basically was like if you're putting love in the world then you know i'm here to help also every other word was a curse word and so he's just like this, this there's a video there's a, a documentary on netflix that's just really wonderful i mean this person uh was one of the most uh profound people in um in the music industry supporting black artists and er almost everyone all the way to this generation um or to our generation. So, you know, when you get into Puffy and Kanye and a bunch of those people, they all also go back to him. Yeah. Yes, I feel the I, well, there are so many unsung heroes and I think that's the point of this. And frankly, if you're, if you're watching this and you're, 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 you don't quite understand why the Black Lives Matters moment is, is profound and why this is not about something that just happened to happen during COVID, but it's actually, the culmination of hundreds of years of oppression. Let's learn, watch some things, it, you know, just humbly watch, don't react, uh, just listen. Cause I think that's that's really important. Peter, do we have uh, one or two more that we wanted we to? Do, you know, interesting to point out when you go to Netflix now, I think a number of the services, when you go on, their version of those splash pages of Black Lives Matter is essentially a collection of films that do just this. Uh, so th yeah. right there, just the, a lot of people have curated inspiring, thoughtful, historical, kind of empathetic, learned stuff. And if, if mm. we're in a moment where the whole point is to understand something and learn history viscerally, there's a great film record. Um, yeah. And since many of us are at home and there's COVID, it is a, if, if there's going to be Binge a watch. or a learn yeah. in, there you go. Yeah. We have learn in. One last one, I think, yeah? At least. And well, I have an assignment there, there oh, as this is playing. Okay. Maybe you could think through if there was a flourishing film festival or a flourishing cities film festival, oh. what would you, from your practice, recommend? And maybe we'll talk about that a bit later. Or now, books. I'd like to. I'd like to remember that books are good <laughs> ways of learning too. I like. I'm a. I'm a. This is fake, of course, but I'm a book fan. Yeah. Um, okay, let's let's play the last one, which is Invisible Portraits, which also just came out. Um, if in this era of police violence, white women have been weaponized uh, and used as kind of the way to rile up people about how evil black men are, which frankly is one of the many things that's happened. Um, uh, Invisible Portraits is actually about the unsung roles of black women in America. And uh, let's run the trailer for that one. The most disrespected person in America is the black woman. The most unprotected person in America is the black woman. From the beginning, everything was set up for us not to survive. We were meant to survive as units of labor. We were meant to survive as commodities. Society's views toward black women are framed through these particular images. 
She's aggressive, violent, She's out of control. That's all you are. It flies in the face of the reality of who we are. For decades, all we wanted was to be accepted and visible instead of invisible. The only way that can happen is if we ensure that it happens by creating our own narrative and knowing our own stories. You have to be able to give words to it, give names to it. If you don't tell your own story, somebody else will. By telling our own stories, there is a kind of fierce independence of mind, of will, tenacity. No matter what stands in our way, no matter how hard it gets, still we rise. I will stay strong. I'm never giving up faith. I will go on. Go on the way. This will be the day. There's nothing more beautiful. Brave. Unbossed. Loving. Independent. Strong. Divine. I think that black women are divine. That's great. I, yeah, I just, I think there's some, some good, good stuff out there. Um, it's not necessarily going to show up in everybody's search. It's not going to show up in everybody's everybody's playlist because, like it or not, most of these um, services, Amazon, Netflix, etc., they're trying to tune themselves to you and your likings. Although I will give credit, as as uh, Peter said, many of these have have tried to double down and and raise awareness. Um, you can also just listen, and and uh, and I think there are some tough questions out there. Uh, that uh, none of us have the answer to. And I don't think our job is to necessarily come up with all the answers. I think our job is to actually not ask every single person who we happen to know that's black to explain the hell that they have been through. They are the victims in many of these things. How about let them just be Americans uh, and, and move forward? And, and how do we uh, do what we can do in the roles that we have to do something different? That's, that's what we, we can do. They're not going to solve this themselves, and we can't solve this. But we have uh, an incredible privileged position, and we have to look for how we can take advantage of those positions to, to do something different. Book club. No. Flourishing club. city thing. What's, what's the next right. question? So, so, uh, well, I mean, before we go into that, I just want to mention a little bit about um, – did I talk to you guys about my novel? Did I ever talk no, to you about wait. my novel? Tell me about the novel. Yeah, so it, it's interesting. You know, I mean, everything, there's a, there's a perfect time for everything. So I worked on a book for 16 years that the idea oh, wow. came to me when I was in college. And um, it's about, and then it, it took, you know, it took me 16 years to write it. And then I published it in 08. And it's about nine women, nine black women who uh, found a technology company that then funds foundations uh, for uh, black women and girls in North America, South America, and Africa. And it's an action adventure conspiracy theory. Um, but what's really amazing about it is um, one, it shows uh, women sharing power. Um, it's mm. actually used by non-black women's organizations when they bring on new board members to show what it looks like when women share power. And so in the, in the course of this book at the very beginning, um, the action starts immediately with the assassination of their CEO. And so then the women have to navigate financial theater and um, a variety of things in order to, you know, in order to survive and to steward all of the women and girls who are in their organization. 
And so, but but what it really shows, and it's really timely. I mean, I, I have a tendency to be ahead of my time. <laughs> it happens often. Um, so I wrote it a while ago, but um, what's really timely now, especially with sort of like the current um, crop of, um, you know, rising, uh, you know, female and black female politicians and, and, and women in other areas of society, especially women of color, um, it shows women sharing power. Um, and it shows women committing to a great and grand goal, uh, larger than the self and being collectively successful together. And so now we're, you know, we're going to combine it actually with uh, leadership uh, for black female excellence as well. And so um, it's just really, you know, it's a very special book. Um, the women are, you know, sort of like every, every background, every hue, every, type of, uh, you know, or not every type, but, you know, what one might think it's the, the full cast of, of black female possibility. And, um, you know, I, I think it's really timely as well and starting to get, you know, in the last couple of weeks, a lot of attention. Nicole, that's crazy. You never told me about a novel. I don't, or maybe you mentioned that I totally zoned out. I'm excited to read that. Um, you know, you make <laughs> yeah, me, it's you, pretty cool. You make me think about how do we build this? What would be some other books or movies or things um, for flourishing cities? Uh, and and I have one suggestion just to to get the ball rolling. I recently read a book called the, the, the Internet is pictures. Um, This is called uh, 5 p.m. Internet Syndrome. And 5 p.m. Internet Syndrome <laughs> is not an infrequent in Mickey Land. Can you hear us? Yes. All right. so, Can you hear me back? <laughs> okay, you're back. Go ahead. No. Um, or not. Uh, by the way, to put an ad in here for Monkey Brains, the internet service provider, about three days into uh, quarantine, when we realized that everybody was at home, I noticed that my Comcast would just grind to a halt at 11 in the morning every day. And so I called up Monkey Brains, which for 35 bucks a month sticks a, a microwave antenna on your roof and you have bi-directional 40 megabytes. It works. And Mick, I, I still expect you to get it because people are not going to be using the internet any less in days to come. Do we need the internet? Well, so to um, answer your question, what are the books for flourishing? I would say they, they still are to be written, um, you know, and and part of it is that, I mean, of course, you know, my lens is always is really tied to technology and psychology. Um, and so I, I think very much through a technology lens, um, one of the things from our flourishing summit, uh, Flourishing City Summit was just, you know, people who don't think through the technology lens and being in deep discussion with them, uh, which was wonderful. But so for me, you know, I think part of it, you know, one of the things that's really limiting is that we have these right now. And so when people think about technology, um, they tend to think about all the crappy technology and think that the crappy technology is what the future technology is going to be. And that's only true if, if we don't do something about it. You know, it's only it's only going to be crappy if we let it be crappy, uh, if we don't demand different things. Uh, and so for that, we have to envision what we might want and understand that technology there, then we apply the technology. So we sort of need the solution. So to answer your question about, you know, what is the, you know, what would be the books for flourishing? I think it really is sort of like the books that would allow us to really imagine what we would want um, and then uh, look at the technologies for it. And, and something, something else that I'm doing tied to that is I'm working on a project for Black Exponentials. And basically we're going to um, combine fiction writers with uh, people to do technology policy essays. Um, and, uh, and so show an illustration of what things might look like if they're, if they're great. So we'll use, we'll use the fiction for the white mirror side, and then we'll use the essay for, you know, the, the, 
what happens if we don't do something or what could happen if we don't do something as well as a recommendation. Um, so, you know, that's an example of, you know, you have to sort of show what might be possible. There's a reason why the first communicator in Star Trek looked like, or the first flip phone looked like the communicator in Star Trek. You know, it's, a, it's because the art and the science led, I mean, the art led um, and ultimately became the technology. There's an interesting point here about the art of film and cities, Nicole, and also this question of flourishing. I, I made a point at the top of the hour that uh, um, we didn't always think of cities as a place to have uh, uh, wonderful times in or to have spiritual moments or to enjoy the way we enjoy parks and the reason that we love being in density. Uh, in the industrial era, cities were hard places. They, they're a place you want to get away from. I mentioned the D Dickens. And you can see this in film, and you can actually see the moment that this pivoted when we started having fun with cities. So if Mead, we can put this up. This is an article from Places Journal. Places Journal is a, is a journal about placemaking. And uh, this is an article recently. It's called Adventure Playground, John Lindsay and the uh, Transformation of New York. I mean, famously, uh, Lindsay talked about New York as fun city. And he was given some grief because New York was going through tough times. But the way that New York had been depicted in film until the 60s was kind of as a very difficult kind of a dirge. And the film talk, this thing talks about the film The Pawnbroker, uh, which was made by Sidney Lumet. And it was about uh, the very difficult life of a guy who trudged to work and, and, uh, and, and did this kind of low life stuff. And it was a very depressing, um, you know, this was kind of what was, what was wrong. And then a few years later, and, and there's a there's a shot from that. You can see it's kind of depression. A few years mm. later, out comes a thousand clowns, which used all sorts of locations and depicted New York as a wonderful place to experience yourself and have a great a great time. And there's a shot further down in there of Gene Wilder and Zero Mostel uh, actually dancing on the Accutron clock. This was from the producers in nineteen in 1967. But New York was transforming from. Uh, kind of a place of toil to a place of wonder. And this was also the same time that Thomas Hoving, the parks commissioner, closed Central Parks on the weekend for people to appreciate. Um, I, I know about this because the first internship I had as a kid, as a kid under Mayor Beam, I think, was working for the New York City Film Motion Picture and Film Department. We were trying to get people to make films in New York. So there's this whole and, and I bring it up because when we talk about flourishing cities, some of this is how do we enjoy the city? How does the city support uh, our, our wellness and 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 in and, and the parks and just the density of people, something we've been missing through COVID? And so there's a wonderful history here. And we can come back and kind of we can take a gander through history and how people have enjoyed cities as perhaps a guide for what we might do into our flourishing future. Yeah, you know, and I think it's also... Um, you know, a part of, we didn't talk about it much at the top of the hour, but part of one of the ways that this also came about in addition to, you know, my bumping into you and us having, you know, this fabulous conversation that sort of kicked it all off was that I had been, you know, I've always been deeply interested in cities and uh, the places that we live and how our cities define us and we define our cities. And so, when I was talking to people who were building smart cities and and they were telling me how they were using light, sound, temperature, or they were, you know, thinking about those things for buildings. It started with smart building people. And I asked them, well, what technology are you using to do that? And I discovered that it was the same technologies that we were using in the devices for individuals. It made me realize that there's this entire additional canvas. Um, that could be used for transformation, and that we weren't using it. And and in many cases, especially you know, given the the impact of light, sound, and temperature on well-being, um, there was you know, like the tech actually was already in there, and the building OSs were already in there um, to do it, but they just hadn't been given a measure uh, to um, to optimize for that included anything related to the people in the buildings. It simply was you know, uh, climate control and uh, environmental sustainability. Very important, but it's sort of, it seemed to me, it's like, well, the tech's already there. We just need to tell it something else. And then a little bit after that, I came across through you, the generative design 
uh, examples from MIT, how people were doing that with cities. And it was like, ah, oh, you know, it's like, there's a lot of cities are definitely more than buildings, but there's a lot of buildings in cities. Um, so you could get, you know, a big chunk of real estate just with buildings um, alone. And then the general design allows you to include things that are non-technical by putting them as optimization points into software. And then the whole city becomes a canvas for transformation. We have much more of this that we will focus on and uh, we're going to get organized for uh, how we can do collaborations across our audience and reach and kind of innovation networks in the world. Mick, we may, it's been a very long week. We have been existing with uh, Nicole and her team on Singapore time and on West Coast time as part of this conference, in addition to, of course, quarantine. So I want to thank thank you all. We've probably earned a drink. In, in my case, it's empty. So that's probably a key. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. uh, Nicole, thank you so much. We will continue this great conversation that we had all week. Mick, have a great weekend. And uh, Before and, you, and you go, Peter, yeah. I just want to thank you uh, both, you and Mickey, for being such great partners. Um, you know, and it's just, it was been fantastic to work with you um, and fantastic to get to know you better and fantastic to make something together, which was wonderful. So thank you very much. It's the start of something. And uh, you you got me out of the house and on location to film bits all week long. So that was fun. Um, <laughs> uh, we'll be back next week. Everybody have a great weekend and keep safe because we got to keep that in mind. Thank you all. It is now 516 Pacific Quarantine. Have a great weekend. Bye, everybody. Let's get close, but not so close. Quarantine. You can share from a distance. Quarantine. You know we want to see each other. You'll have to stay in your quarantine space while we talk.